I had expected to have a little set thing out on the grounds with all of you. But what is it said? Man proposes, God disposes. There were so many of you who have come this afternoon, this evening. And uh, so we, it seemed wiser to have the satsang inside. I hope on other occasions, however, that we can have that satsang outside. In the early years, many years ago, we used to have our meditations and our services out of doors here on these grounds with our beloved Guru Paramahansa Yogananda. Incidentally, are you all from this area? Huh? You come from different parts of... Some of you come from Los Angeles and San Diego? Yes, I see. So nice to see all of you. Are you all members? Huh? How lovely. Huh? What am I going to say to you? I thought I was going to meet with a little group of devotees, a handful of devotees. I come and I find a vast audience of devotees. But uh, let, let us just meet informally, as we used to do with Master, and let this be a time of what we call in India satsang, or meditation and talk and communion with God. Satsang means this. Our title of our society in India is called Yagoda Satsanga. Yoga means union of the soul with spirit. Scientific union of the soul with its creator spirit. And Satsanga means spiritual fellowship. So, translated into English, we call it self-realization fellowship. Meaning realization of the soul or the self, that spark of the divine within every one of us and within all created things, and fellowship with all mankind. And the true purpose of self-realization fellowship is just that, that we are all one. And it seems to me certainly in this modern age, in this day, the need to become more aware of our oneness is there. And it will be increasingly necessary as the years go by. As Guruji often spoke to us, and as many writers tell us today, we are launched on an entirely new age. We are on the threshold of a new age, which the world was, sh uh, you might say, we were shocked into that. New age by the atomic bomb, the atomic energy. We are forced now, because we couldn't learn it in any other way, we are forced by circumstances, by our own karma, to learn how to get along with one another. It is said in the Bible, isn't it, that the meek shall inherit this earth. He who uses the sword will fall by the sword. That so long as man thinks that the way to freedom and the way to power and the way to wisdom and the way to love is by force, so long man will suffer. It is only when we begin to realize that the only way that we can find that spiritual and mental and material and moral freedom which we all strive to attain, can only be realized as we strive to be more meek. Now, I don't mean weak. There's a great deal of difference between meekness and weakness. There is a great deal of difference between cowardice and spiritual strength, and spiritual humility. But this world, because of the rapid and tremendous strides we have made, in the field of science, this world has become much smaller. And as a result, we have become, we have been forced to, you might say, expand our consciousness. We're going to longer think in terms of little Encinitas or little San Diego or little Los Angeles or little California or our little United States. 
We've got to begin to think in broader terms. We've got to begin to have a real respect or reverence for all life. And I say this, that it isn't only we who've got to have that respect and reverence for all life. All nations have got to have that reverence and respect for all life. The purpose of self-realization is to endeavor to help man to lift up his consciousness and to broaden and expand his consciousness and to break away from all of these long-held to prejudices and smallness of mind and heart. They don't belong in the New Age. They don't belong in the man of the New Age. We've got to recognize the fact That electricity is electricity, whether it flows through a red bulb or a brown bulb or a yellow bulb or a white bulb or a blue bulb. You cannot say that the electricity is either white, yellow, blue, brown, or black. The electricity is electricity. So in the same way, the one common cosmic beloved God is manifest in all the different races and in all the different creeds. And we have got to recognize that. How dare we abuse him in any form? How dare we deny him in any creed? When he is the sole creator of everything in this universe. Without him there is not beside. All things are contained in him. And when we discriminate against anyone... We dare to discriminate against him who is the very breath and life and foundation of our being. Isn't it so? Man has got to expand his consciousness if he's going to continue to exist in this world. There's no other way. And I am not trying to leave you with a sense of fear, but I want to tell you, you have only to look and read the papers, not only in this country, but in all the countries where I've been, to realize we're at the nation's in a mess. Who made it? God didn't make this mess. His master used to say to us, he made a beautiful world, and you have only to go outside and look at the sky, the heavens, and the ocean, and all the beautiful things he's created. It is man who made a nightmare out of this dream of God. No one else but us. Then you will say, well, do you believe in non-war? Well, we come back now to the Bhagavad Gita's teaching. When we have a snake in a room, and uh, if the snake is paying no attention to anyone and it's going its own way, leave it alone. But if it's going to bite someone, your duty, if you, if you remain silent saying, I'll practice non-violence, you're guilty. When you are defending, then it is not wrong to resist. But when you are aggressive, when you are the aggressive one, then it is wrong. It's as simple as that. A man has to always watch his heart. It is here where this silent little voice tells us how to behave. But sometimes because we have stopped listening to that voice, it it doesn't speak so loudly. We can't hear it. But the more we try to hear that still, small voice of conscience within, the more it guides us and tells us how to behave in this world. But when we drown it out by restlessness and by emotions of hatred and anger and resentment, then it ceases to speak to us. Isn't it so? Moses tried to teach this thousands of years ago. In his Ten Commandments, he told us what to do. He gave us those Ten Commandments. It is because we have forgotten them that we're suffering. It's as simple as that. Thou shalt not hate, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not covet thy neighbors. All of these Ten Commandments. It is because, you see, we're we're living in a modern age and we think, oh, these things are all outmoded. It's ridiculous. Truth is never outmoded. It may come 
in the different ages, clothed in a new set of words, but it's the same old truth. It is eternal. We have to learn to apply it in our lives if we would know what peace is. Any other questions? Hmm? Can you tell us something of your visit to Father G. Cave when you were in India? All right, I'll tell you. There was a very special relationship between Master and Babaji, and we disciples who were close to him knew it. He often referred to Babaji, referred to his experience when Babaji came to him before he ever came to this country. And whenever he spoke of Babaji, it was with such such devotion with such a feeling of worship is the only word I can use that it used to just fill our hearts. And I know that mine in particular used to just feel as if it was bursting whenever he referred to Babaji. Since Master's going, the thought of Babaji has been even greater in my own consciousness. I know now why I didn't then. I used to wonder why it was that in my prayers, with all due love and feeling for my other beloved Param Gurus, there was a special feeling for Babaji and for my own Master. But feeling myself extremely unworthy and certainly the lowliest of masters, devotees, and I mean that sincerely. I never thought to want to, what shall I say, I couldn't presume ever to have any experience with Babaji. I felt that perhaps in some life that experience would come to me. I only knew one thing. I don't ask, I've never wanted any experience, I've never asked for any experience. I just love. My joy comes in in being in love with God. There is no other reward I seek but that in this life. When we went to India this last time, two of the devotees with me expressed a wish to visit Babaji's cave. I felt a little bit ashamed of myself because I thought, why is it you haven't that desire to go there? Analyzing it, I realized it was because I was unworthy. Why should I go? What would I gain? In other words, how dare I presume that he would come to me, that he would deign to see me, that he would deign to make known his presence to me. I wasn't sufficiently, what shall I say, receptive. That was my feeling. We went to India, and during my stay in Calcutta, I expressed the devotees wish to visit Babaji's cave. And in communicating with the officials in Delhi, the central government, we were told that it was not possible because, you see, India is in a state of emergency, has been for several years. The world doesn't seem to know that. As a result, her borders are closed to anyone from the West. And, of course, this is up near the border high in the Himalayan mountains. And so we were told, no, that it wouldn't be possible. I never worry about such things because I think if Divine Mother wants, I've seen too many miracles, I know she has the power, if she wills. And if she doesn't will, I have no wish in the matter. Strangely enough, about a day or two later, the secretary came to us again, our devotee in India, he's Hindu, and he said, Ma, as they call me in India, Ma, would you still wish to go? I said, is it possible to go? 
He said, we have just been in touch with the governor of the UP state, and that is the state in which these Himalayan mountains, where Babaji lives, are located. And he has given you special permission with your party to visit this area. Within two days, we were ready. We didn't have the warm clothing. We went in just this kind of cotton sari with just a little tiny wool coverlet around our shoulders. But we, uh, being very foolhardy, I presume, we just were on the train. We arrived at the governor's home around 8 o'clock at night, and at 10 o'clock that same night, we were on the little train going toward the little railway station of Kat Gadam. We arrived at Kat Gadam. Please forgive me, I don't, this kind of experience I don't like to talk about very much, but since you've asked, I will try. We arrived at the little station of Kat Gadam around, must have been just dawn. The rest of the way we were to go by car, all the way up the winding mountain to the top where they have a hill station where pilgrims can stay. I sat in that little railroad station all alone. The devotees were all gone. My mind was completely withdrawn from this world. All I could think about was Babaji. I was practicing what we call in India Jap yoga. Jap yoga means to simply take the name of the divine and with deep feeling and devotion repeat it again and again and again so that your whole consciousness becomes completely lost in one thought to the exclusion of everything. And so I was practicing this. I was taking the name of Babaji. And I was just bursting. I can't tell you. My being, from never having any desire to go, I was just bursting with a thrill I can't describe to you. And suddenly whole consciousness became absolutely just sucked out of this world, sucked up into another state of mind, state of consciousness, and I lost all awareness of, of this world. And the presence of Babaji I beheld. And I just inwardly, taking the dust of his feet, I just sobbed. And you see, Master had told the devotees, this. You need never concern yourselves with who, with the leadership of our society. Babaji has already selected those who are destined to lead this work. And so when they chose me, I thought that I, I, I was convinced a mistake had been made. Can't have chosen me. It's impossible. So I was talking to Babaji this way. Babaji, they chose me. I am so unworthy. How could it be? I was just sobbing inwardly at his feet. And then so sweetly he said this to me, My child, you must not doubt your guru. He has told you the truth. He has spoken the truth with his words. As he said that, it was just like a, a great blissful peace came over my being. And I just remained bathed in that. I don't know how long. It was a little bit later that I became aware that there were others in this room, in this station. And as I opened my eyes, I don't know whether you will believe me or not, it doesn't matter to me. As I opened my eyes, I suddenly said, Good heavens, yes, I've been here before. Guruji had said of some of us who were around him, You came with me to the West this time. You are not of the West. You were born in India before. And as I opened my eyes, I said, good heavens, everything was so familiar to me. But of course, I had been here before. And my mind was just surging with such joy that I can't describe. The bus which was to take us up the hill was ready, and I went out and we got in it. And all the way up, up this winding hill, it must have taken us about, oh, maybe two hours, something like that. I was not beholding anything except familiar sights, familiar places. And then we arrived at this little, Dora Hut is the name of the little village. It's just a small little remote village high in the Himalayan mountains. 
It's reached by a very narrow winding pathway that goes all the way up the hill. I arrived there, and then that night, many people, villagers, came from all over the countryside. They had heard that there were some pilgrims from the west who had come there to go up to this cave. Many people talk about Babaji. Baba means father, you see, the father, but G means term of respect. Many people have, there are stories which you hear when you go into this area. And they gathered that night and they asked many questions. We had satsang just as we are having now with them. Many of them understood English. Those who didn't, someone nearby explained to them. After it was over, I sat for my meditation and then lay down in this room to sleep. There were two companions, two of the nuns who were with me, were in the same room with me. As I was sleeping, suddenly, a tremendous black cloud swept over me and was trying to engulf me. As it did so, I cried out. And as I cried out, I awoke and the other companions awoke too. They immediately were alarmed. They wanted to know what had happened. I wouldn't speak. I said, I don't, I don't want to talk about it. Let us just go back to sleep. But I knew what the divine was telling me. It was a symbol to me. If you ask how I know, as, as one, as you all meditate, and I'm sure you've all had this experience, one sense of intuition, one sixth sense, that all-knowing sense develops. And many things you experience. Now, experiences have not been a part of my craving in this life. I don't find them an essential part of my relationship with God. There have been many remarkable experiences in my life, some of which I have related to you, some of which I ask Master questions about, but what is essential in my relationship with God is just to be in love. That's all I have asked for in this life to be in love only with God. But this night as I lay to sleep, chanting Babaji's name, and as sleep was coming over my consciousness, then took place this superconscious dream. There was a tremendous cloud that began to envelop the whole world, a dark cloud, a black cloud, and also began to envelop this physical form as well. And it was at that time that I cried out, and it awoke me from this superconscious experience. Uma Mata and Ananda Mata were with me, and, of course, they were concerned. I didn't explain the reason for my outcry, nor did the experience frighten me. This I say to you. It's a very important point. It didn't frighten me, but it was as if it was a forecast of events to come, and it was exactly what happened. The effect it had as that vision or superconscious dream was taking place was that while it was unfolding, the divine was showing me its meaning. And that was that the world was going to be plunged in chaos, in darkness. That was in 1963. You have seen it since take place. There is confusion all over the world. It also indicated that there would be some difficulties with this body. This was the first awareness that Divine Mother showed me of troubles that would begin. 
But do know, it is a fact that one week to ten days after we left Babaji's cave, this body was stricken ill. I was forced to cancel my tour of India in 1963, or a portion of it. I was rushed back to Calcutta for an emergency operation. But I have always remembered the end of that dream. And that was that as the dark forces of evil were trying to envelop mankind, were trying to envelop the nations, a tremendous force of light was resisting the dark cloud. And the dark clouds evaporated and faded away. Only the light remained. That had a definite meaning for all mankind. And it certainly has a definite meaning today and will in the days to come. And it makes me understand more than ever why this message of self-realization is here at this point of time in the history of mankind. It is needed now. It is sorely needed now. And so, the next morning, as we were sitting, having our, eating our oranges and our crackers, the devotees asked the question and again. I said, I don't, let us not dwell on it. I'd rather not talk about it. But I knew what the divine was telling me. We started out that morning at nine o'clock, and this time we had to walk. Sometimes we took what we call a dandi. A dandi is just a little, it's a little carriage that is car and very roughly hewn out of, out of wood that is carried by four men over their shoulders on, two, on sticks, two men in front and two behind. Sometimes one travels in that, sometimes by horse, and sometimes by walking with a stick. We walked all day long from nine in the morning until five o'clock at night, climbing ever upward, sometimes sliding. Don't think that these were deep, steep hillsides, but they were very difficult, extremely tiresome, very, very hot, and not at all an easy pilgrimage to make. Once I remember falling as we were climbing and bumping the shoulder, and for two days, this arm was carried in a sling. The pain was so great. It was toward sunset when we arrived at Babaji's cave. And as I looked up, this entire mountain was the most beautiful golden color you can imagine. And as I saw it, I remember thinking, this must be the color that Master was referring to when he described the beautiful golden palace and the golden light that surrounded that palace when he gave Lahiri Mahajaya the Kriya initiation. It was a magnificent color, brilliant golden light. There were many weeds, very tangled growth over the opening into this cave a very small opening leading into a larger area, and beyond that, another area, which had become covered with rocks and soil through the years. We sat in that little cave. Uh, Nandama Umama had made a little flag with one of our ochre-colored handkerchiefs with the golden lotus symbol on it. And 
we put that little symbol, that little flag in the interior of this cave. We sat, we meditated. We deeply prayed to Babaji for all of you and for all of those faithful devotees who are to come that by the faithful devoted practice of the sacred technique of Kriya Yoga they might achieve that state of bliss, that state of oneness with God, which is the ultimate goal of all mankind. And without which goal, without the achievement of which goal, our souls will never be content. No human love, no human craving, no sense satisfaction, no thing will ever be able to give us contentment. That will come only and joy and unconditional love. That will come only as we the souls become more aware of and more in tune with the one beloved of our hearts, God and God alone. We could not remain overnight at Babaji's cave because, as we learned at that very moment, at dusk, the wild animals, the leopards and the tigers, would begin their nightly roaming for food. It never occurred to me nor any of us, with the exception of perhaps our Indian companions, that there was any danger, that we had to feel the least concern. And very frankly, I couldn't have cared less. <laughs> it just didn't enter my consciousness to feel any concern at all. But there were urgings that we must not stay overnight and that we must start back down the mountain. By this time, the sun had begun to set and darkness was falling over the entire mountain and area around it. I noted as we went down from the cave, and bear in mind that the same consciousness was there. If you want God, try it for 48 hours. If you want some response for God, with a calm, steady, devotional mind, Take the name of the divine over and over and over and over until you're churning the ether with one thought. Nobody need know what you are doing. But you will find without doubt, without exception, the response of God. This was a state my consciousness was in. And all the way down the mountainside, the native people who had accompanied us, there were a party of 40 who had come from all villages just to join this pilgrimage. All the way down the mountain, oh, they were chanting so beautifully, chanting, and I was just drunk with joy, drunk with the bliss, drunk with a sense of such contentment, never having had the desire to go but having gone and felt such fulfillment, such complete happiness, such complete awareness of beloved Babaji's presence. I was just absorbed in that thought. And these villagers had picked up that vibration and they were singing all the way down that hill. Around seven at night, we started back down the hill. And around nine, we landed at a mountain dweller's little home. And it was the sweetest. I wish I could have shared that experience with all of you. Around that home, we sat fire blazing out of doors. And we were served 
roasted potatoes, and heavy black bread. Oh, the best tasting bread you ever, <laughs> was wonderful. It's, it's baked in ashes, it's just as black as it can be. And tea, and that was our dinner, and I never forget how good that tasted. Hi, Nils Humadi Mountains. Around midnight, we arrived back at the government rest house. Incidentally, many people have remarked upon it, the natives in that area. It was sheer faith that brought us through that area because it is so tiger-ridden, so ridden with leopards that is dangerous and no one would ever dream of being out there after dark. But they said ignorance is bliss. It never occurred to us to be frightened. I can't imagine being frightened there. But I wouldn't recommend it for anyone else. Now, throughout all of this time, the experience with Babaji was just part of my whole consciousness. It was like reliving scenes in that area, in that part of the world. That night, I couldn't sleep. As I was sitting meditating, suddenly the whole room lighted up with a golden light. And then I remember it became a very blue light. And then again, this presence of Babaji. And this time, he said a message that was so sweet. My child, and he is all love. His whole nature is praying. My child, you must know this. It is not necessary for devotees to come to this spot in order to find me. Whoever goes within with deep devotion, calling and believing in me, he will find my response. That was his message. And how true that is. How true it is. If you only, if you only believe, if just with a little deep devotion, you silently call on Babaji you will feel that response. And then I said, Babaji, my Lord, our Guru taught us that whenever we want to feel wisdom, pray to Sri Yukteswarji because he was all gyan, he was all wisdom. Whenever you want to feel bliss or ananda, commune with Lady Mahashaya. What is your nature? What is your nature? And as I said, a, a thousand million, oh, this is, my heart was bursting, just going to burst with such love, such love. Then my nature is love, for it is love alone that can change this world. Then I remembered what Master, all of these things tie in together. I remember what Master had said to me before I left his body. I said, Master, when you have gone, you know, usually a society, a religious organization, it dies out. It doesn't grow. When the leader goes, it loses something. But I had said to Master, how will we carry on without you? What will hold us? What will inspire us when you are no longer here in the flesh to inspire us? I never forget his words. Always remember this, he said. When I have left this world, only love can take my place. Be so drunk with the love of God night and day that nothing else will you know but the love of God and give that love to all. That's Babaji's message. That's the message for this age. But it's an eternal message. It's a message that has been preached by all of the great spiritual giants around the world through the ages. And that's the message that we have to apply. That's what's so essential in this day when we are so uncertain of our tomorrows. In this day when it seems that hate is out to destroy the world, we must be soldiers of love. We must be soldiers of compassion. We must be soldiers of understanding. That's what is needed. Babaji is real. He exists. Since that experience, I have no doubt 
I used to wonder, as a young devotee on the path, but is he real? I can see before me, Lady Masha, I have had some experience with Sri Yukteswarji. Is he real? Doubt used to come in my mind. As it does sometimes when you hear about Christ, you never saw him. Wonder, but can I know him? Can I have some experience of him? Of course you can. There are great ones today. I have been reading recently about Father Pio, the Catholic mystic. There are great ones today who commune with Christ. There are great ones today who also commune with great ones like Babaji. He is. He exists. And his message is the eternal message of the divine love. And I don't refer to selfish, narrow, personal love, possessive love. I mean the love which Christ gave to his disciples, unconditional. That's the kind of love that we must give. We all want it. There's not one of us in this room that doesn't cry for love, doesn't cry for a little human understanding, cry for a little something from someone. You know why? Our real nature is perfection. You are the soul. Your nature is perfection. And so you can never be satisfied with anything less than perfection. Isn't it true? So long as we have that perfection in our soul, we can never be satisfied with anything but perfection. And we can never know what perfection is except when we know him who is the perfect lover. Him who is the perfect father, mother, friend, beloved, our God. Most of us think of God as merely a name. Most of us think of God as maybe having some form or maybe formless, or some of us have absolutely no concept of what God is. It doesn't matter. He is all things to all men. It is foolish to say God is either with form. It is foolish to say God is without form. He is both. He is limitless. He is all. Each devotee is to have his own concept of God, whatever appeals to him. My concept of God is formless. Though I think of him as my beloved, though I sometimes think of him as my divine mother, though I sometimes think of him as love, he is without form in my concept of him. But he is love. I am without form. You are all without form. You are simply wearing the electricity is clothed in a bulb is all. But you are not the bulb. Isn't it true? When one thinks about God, one can become just intoxicated with... You see, he is all things. He is wisdom. And when you dwell on the wisdom in the realm of wisdom, you can become just intoxicated with wisdom. You can talk for endless days and nights. Master used to be able to do so on just the one subject. When you think of him as joy, your mind can become so intoxicated with joy that it's just a thousand million blissful experiences are bursting your heart open. Sometimes when I am chanting, it has happened many times in any, when I'm chanting, just a few words of chanting of Divine Mother, I feel as if, oh, I would burst the boundaries of this form. My heart is so engrossed, immersed in that love, that joy. But the sweetest is to experience that love divine. That's been the goal of my life. That is the goal of my life. I'm not interested in anything. I only want to love my God. Many years ago, Master said something that just tore my heart. And it was this, do you realize, as you are all seeking, the divine also is seeking one thing. I thought, well, what on earth could God want? He has everything. He said he has everything in this universe. He controls, he owns everything in this universe. But he has not power over one thing. Do you know what he is craving? What is it? Your love. Night and day. He is crying for our love. When Master said that, I thought, oh, let me just use this life, just making up for everybody who doesn't love him. 
Let me love him so much. He is so, he is so near. He is so dear. He is so sweet. This isn't just words. He is. He is. Don't be satisfied until and unless you know him. Talk to him in the language of your soul. My God, my God, my love, my love. My God, my God. Just let your heart just follow that feeling flowing from your soul. I saw our master in that kind of ecstasy. When he was so drunk with the love of God that the tears, not tears of emotion, my dears, is a great difference, but tears of such devotion pouring down his cheeks. He was just locked in that divine embrace, just saying, it is you. Oh, everything is you. He experienced it. He perceived it. Everything is you. You, oh, only you, my Lord. What a wonderful way to live. What a wonderful way to live in this world, beholding everything as him, striving always to be a messenger of him, a messenger of kindness, a messenger of understanding, a messenger of love. It's what's needed. What happens when we live in that conscience? We're lifted up out of ourselves. We forget our little, confined, imprisoned self, the ego. We begin to commune and to commingle with all men. Isn't it so? That's what loving my God is. Be drunk with him. I often think, oh, if I had the voice of a thousand million eloquent speakers, how I would love to reach into the hearts of the world if only he gave me that power to do so. Only to speak of him who is my beloved, him who is your beloved. This doesn't mean, it doesn't take you away from all those you love. It sweetens, it sweetens your relationship with others. It gives them a beauty, a spiritual beauty and strength which you cannot arrive at in any other way. It is not this flesh that we enjoy, my beloved ones. It is the hope of what we think the flesh may give us that we are striving toward. These senses Use these senses as much as we will, and we will find that we are tormented and, and dissatisfied and discontented. They don't fulfill their promise. If it were so, there wouldn't be all of these beautiful ones who, who have to take drugs and commit suicide because they don't find what they are looking for. What we are hoping is for that beauty of perfection which can only come by going deep within. When this I shall die, then will I know who am I. That's all. And how to get that way? Start with just a little silent conversation with the divine every day of your life. Don't let anyone else know about it. The relationship with God is something the devotee wants to keep to himself. He doesn't want to show it to the whole world. Oh, my Lord, you, you. He walks with me. He talks with me. You want to keep it to yourself. But talk with him a little every day. But in order to do that, the mind must be still. That's why these teachings are so great. That's why these techniques are so marvelous. You must learn to slow down the restless mind. As Guruji used to say to us, the ordinary man's mind is like a pond or a lake into which millions of pebbles have been thrown, and you find millions of ripples all over that lake. Withhold the pebbles, and the lake becomes crystal clear. So the man's mind is like that, is like a lake in which millions of restless thoughts 
have been tossed. But withhold those thoughts. What it means is actually still those thoughts. That's what he meant by be still. And then in that crystal clear lake of the mind, one beholds the undiluted, perfect reflection of the infinite. That's why you should all, that's the value of practicing Hong Sa. He who uses it knows of what I speak. He who doesn't use it, these are only words to him. When I sit to practice Hong Sa, in an instant my mind is still. I am no exception. I am no chosen one of the divine. I have only practiced it. You all must practice it. That's all. Someone said to me yesterday, you have a strong heart, but you are such a low pulse, so slow. Practice. One remains always in that state of calmness within. And when the mind is calm, then, oh, with what joy one can commune with God. My beloved ones, that was the reason for which we are created. There is no other reason, there is no other purpose in life except this. None. The purpose of life is to know God. None other. There was one, and the one divided himself into the many. And the whole urge of life, deny it if you can, the whole urge of life of the many is to get back to the one again. It's the natural urge of the soul, is oneness. Most of mankind seeks oneness with another human being, with another soul. It's all right. In that perfection of oneness, one finds the divine, but... It is easier, simpler to go directly to the one. Because we're all part of the one. That is again why the Lord said, Seek ye God first, and then all things will be added. To seek him first in your life. Doesn't mean you have to become renunciants, wearing the rope. In here is the real hermitage. In here is the real temple of renunciation. Renunciation means to the Lord, you first, then comes the world. That's all. I love my family because I serve them. I serve you and them. I work not for myself, but to express this divinity which is within me. My hands and feet were made to serve thee. My eyes were made to behold only that which is good. My lips were made to speak always truth. My heart was made to love thee first, and loving thee, love all. All right, let us meditate. Just forget everyone else around you, and for just these few moments, deeply, deeply call on God. Talk to him in the language of your heart. Don't be afraid to go to him. Don't be afraid to unburden yourself to God. He already knows. You haven't hidden one thing from him. He knows what we are. And he is so compassionate. He is so understanding. He knows the delusion he has put into this world. He only asks one thing of us. Look to me. Look to me. Receive me. That's all. Let's all pray together. Heavenly Father, Mother, Friend, my beloved God, Jesus Christ, Babaji, Neri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukte Suji, my Guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, the saints of all religions, 
I bow to you all. Divine Mother, Divine Mother, I am thy child, thou art mine. May thy love shine forever on the altar of my devotion. May I be able to awaken thy love in all hearts. Make my soul thy temple. Make my heart thy altar. Make my love thy home. Thou art mine. I am thine. Be with me always. Om Shanti. Peace. Amen. May God bless you all.